Hello, uh, this is Kyle Matthews from the Montreal uh, Institute for Genocide and Rights Studies. Um, we're very pleased today to have another interview for our Coronavirus Diaries, stories from experts and journalists around the world uh, about what's happening during this global pandemic. Uh, we're very happy today to have a well-known New York Times journalist with us, um, Muyi Zhao. Um, so Muyi, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, so maybe I'd like to start off because you've, you've written, done a lot of important work on this, but you, you have a personal connection to Wuhan. That's where you're from. That's where your family is. So I'd like to ask you a bit about um, what is life like, has been like there for your parents or what you're hearing from friends and also what's happening now because a lot of the media is focused on other cities, on France, Italy, and we haven't really heard about what's happening in Wuhan. So I'd like to maybe ask you if you could, you could tell us a bit about about this. Hi Kyle, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, so uh, I am from Wuhan. I grew up there and all my families are still there. My parents, my grandpa, and my childhood friends. So uh, I would say, you know, from um, actually from the end of December, people were, some people like at least me and my family were pretty alarmed because we were seeing like, uh, you know, screenshots uh, from doctors warning about a SARS-like virus circling around the city. So we were already pretty alarmed. Um, and then things got quiet for a while because as you know, like people got censored and silenced. Um, but then we are seeing more cases uh, popping out outside of China. So we kind of know like the situation in Wuhan must be so much worse than we knew. Um, so January was like the month that we were all, you know, like being on a roller coaster, like we were hoping it was nothing, but then it turned out to be something very, very serious. Uh, and especially the day that Wuhan um, started the lockdown and we started to see a skyrocket in um, the confirmed cases and death cases. And pretty much everyone, um, you know, someone has someone they know um, sometimes family, sometimes uh, friends have like either got infected or died. So we are hearing like devastating stories every day from the people that we love the most. So it's, it was a very depressing and traumatizing period of time um, in January and February. And in February, you know, like especially from the beginning of February, we are seeing like more uh, censorship. Um, and the authority, authorities' efforts mm -hmm. to silence people. So on top of that, you know, like devastation of like for the loss, we are also experiencing a lot of anger toward like how we're being treated, how people are treated by the authorities. Um, so that was in February. But then, you know, Chinese government did tr uh, take very drastic measures. Um, and, and it did work in, in, in some level. And, you know, like we see the case started to use, the increase of cases started to slow down and things started to get better by, uh, you know, in, in early March. Yeah, so now everyone feels a little bit better um, because, you know, we, we won't be able to know how many cases really in Wuhan right now, but it's not that many, you know, like it's not like what it was like in January or February. So the, the yeah. crisis point is, is somewhat over, but are people, do they, are they able to walk around freely or are they still under kind of self-isolation or under, under quarantine? Is that, is that still taking place? Yeah, in Wuhan it is. So some uh, traffic control was lifted uh, outside of Wuhan in Hubei province, but in Wuhan is still, you know, everyone still have to stay home. But um, previously you have to stay in your apartment, but now you can go downstairs. Like my, like my mom recently just went downstairs after staying in her 90 square feet apartment for 60 days. So she just stepped downstairs for the first wow. time in 60 days, yeah. So, so I have to ask you, so, so this uh, it seems like this, this pandemic started in, in Wuhan and within mm -hmm. a very short time frame, it's, it's expanded across the globe and, and actually has really is now starting to really impact the United States where you live. So I understand you, you were living in New York City, you're not there now, but could you maybe talk about, um, you know, how did you see this coming? Like, did you expect this or was it a surprise? And, and how, how are you seeing this from, from being in the United States right now? Um, yeah, so I don't think it's a surprise to me because 
just like because I have been following this so closely since January, I know how infectious this virus is. So it, it, I was assuming that it was going to spread across the globe very fast because it is just impossible to stop it almost because, you know, like you have so many asymptomatic cases that can spread the virus all the time, like everywhere. And people are not wearing masks like outside of China uh, or sorry, like in like most of the Western countries, definitely not in the US. So like when people don't wear masks and don't take enough precautions and when this virus can be spreaded, when people don't have any symptom, there's just no way to stop it. So I was already expecting things can get bad here. Um, and I think I was mostly surprised just like how, people how to say like how people were not like taking strict measures here even like in early march like this thing has been going on very seriously in mm -hmm. asia for two months and mm -hmm. things were being pretty quiet like everyone's reading news every day about wuhan how devastating the situation is but then it seems like they're just going back to their normal life here you know, I see that here in Montreal. We've, we've taken it very seriously. We've, we've shut down our border with the U.S. Never seen in my lifetime. But I, yeah. I see, we still see people that are outside and they, they just don't take this seriously. And they think that, oh, it, I'm young, it won't impact me. But I, I saw the original images from Wuhan and I said, this is serious. This is yeah. not a normal issue. This is something much, much more contagious. Um, yeah. so, so I'd like to ask you a question. that you, you've, you've worked on two very important pieces um, that came to my attention. Uh, the first one was was you wrote with some of your colleagues in, in February, and it was about people in China that were taking to social media to talk about the coronavirus. Um, and there was some, sometimes you mentioned that there was, the authorities would try to clamp down on that. It, maybe you could tell me a bit about what, what you found when you're doing research for this, uh, for your article, and, and if that's still taking place today. Yeah, so that piece was about uh, China's, you know, censorship, after China's censorship has kicked in, there are more, we, we see that there are more uh, citizens, Chinese citizens kind of join this online effort to like archive stuff, in a, like in resistance to the censorship. So they found those articles that they think are at risk to censorship, and then they would move the content to platforms that is outside of the Great Firewall, um, like, you know, GitHub and YouTube. Uh, so that, you know, even the original content was censored, people could still access uh, and read it. Uh, and, you know, this is a thing that I knew exist previously um, when there was some like, you know, social incident going on, uh, but like never at this scale. So we talked to ex experts to ask, you know, what's their take on this and if they see that there's anything new about it. So every expert told us that they have never seen people like working on this at such a scale. I mean, it has, it might have something to do with like people are staying at home because they are quarantined and so they have a lot of time. Um, that's, that might be one reason. And the other reason is like, this is a public health issue and it's affecting much more people, not like, you know, unlike Me Too or some other incidents were it more, mostly affecting a group of people. This is a thing that is affecting everyone. So more people have the will to join the effort. Uh, yeah, so like I'm very, I'm very touched by people's effort, uh, but you know, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. Like you, you just don't know like, you know, right now, like they can still do this, but like we don't know when the, the authorities will find new ways to try to shut those platforms down. Well, I remember when this was unfolding, and I was I, I really was looking for information about what was going on because I was trying to imagine what is life like in a city of 12 million people that's on lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I remember I came across some I know about the Great Chinese Firewall and how some of the you know the big social media platforms aren't available to everyday users, but the, some people were getting past that and posting videos. And I, I did notice that some of these, I guess, citizen journalists um, were then, then disappeared. No one knows what happened to them. So I've been watching this and it, 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 I think that is a, is a, it's a, it's a very interesting story to follow. Somewhat sad because um, people are trying to express social solidarity with each other. Um, yeah. Maybe if I could ask you, you just, um, I think it was late last week, early this week, you also worked on a, a really interesting article that analyzed a lot of the um, the public diplomacy uh, and the Twitter uh, accounts coming from uh, Chinese state-run media and also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and diplomat Chinese diplomats around the world. 
Um, and I've noticed there's been a, a bit of a, a global battle of narratives at this point, but could you maybe talk a bit about um, how you did this research and, and what your findings were? Yeah, so we generated this idea because, you know, we I, we first noticed that China has been, you know, really uh, ramping up the uh, the uh, the propaganda machine internally, like in China. You can see like, you know, censorship keep kicking, you know, they are like deciding what to take down and what to put up. And then we kind of think, okay, so this has been going on in China every time. But then the China setting, Chinese government setting up all these like huge resources that targeting overseas audience. This is fairly new because you know it, it has been a couple of years and um, but especially last year, there's so many Chinese diplomats hopped on Twitter. So all these things is pretty new. And so the COVID-19 is actually, I would say like a perfect opportunity for them to kind of demonstrate those resources and like and put them into action and for us it was a good good opportunity to like examine how they would utilize those resources and the i think a good way is to you know to um the way to analyze their message is to just do like text analysis so we basically scraped like thousands of tweets and just see what they are trying to say you know what are each messages were trying to say what's the proportion of different messages because i remember at that time people was like really paying a lot of attention to like uh some chinese uh diplomats was trying to say like this is from us it's not from like the virus is not from china and i am just also personally curious like is it that really the main message? Was there any other things they were trying to say? What's the difference with like the, um, between their strategies towarding uh, targeting like the overseas readers versus like domestic readers? Mm -hmm. And then we just found out that uh, you know the overall strategy is actually pretty similar. Um, the, like the the biggest message they are trying to do is uh, is just like it's not just it's like um, they are uh, trying to give us positive spin to the tragedy like they are putting up all this like very positive energy stories like how people are battling how much effort they've been putting how effective the re responses are um that's the same thing they're doing in china and th the other thing is we find out is that um china has been like it's kind of like a shift in the narrative like um in in the early stage of the outbreak chinese government was more more uh, like those accounts were more sending messages about like they receive uh, help from the other countries that they are grateful and they are collaborating with the international commu uh, community stuff like that and then uh, entering March they started to say more things about they are donating things to other country helping other country become a global leader and that was also consistent with China and uh, the last thing we find out is that uh, that Chinese government, uh, Chinese officials trying to say, uh, like the virus, uh, dispute the origin of the virus. It, it exists, but it's a small portion, but it exists. It's so crazy, so we pick it up very easily, you know. And these are also the three main messages, like I, uh, from my experience, I see on Chinese, like domestic platforms. But one thing that we note, and also we uh, asked several experts, they also noticed that, is that the tone they use, like in those outbound platforms are less provoking than what they are saying, like domestically to Chinese audience. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I've been following some of the, um, you know, the spats by the um, the spokesman for um, the Chinese Foreign Ministry is being very outspoken, and he tweeted, um, you know, the, that that there is some tie to the U.S. But but what I found interesting and and just just my observation is that he tweeted um, an article on a website of a Montreal, Canada-based uh, organization called Global Research. Mm -hmm. um, which is really like a conspiracy theory website. It, it, it's, it's really, there's everyone believes conspiracies, almost like the info wars uh, of the left in Canada. And, and when I saw them sharing that, I, I just, I thought that was, if you're going to get anything that's more, um, that's truthful that people can, can fact check, that would not be the one uh, that, that I, would, I would share if I was trying to get a message across. Um, so maybe my last question to you, um, because you've been very generous with your time and, um, uh, but I'd like to ask, there's been increasing uh, comments and concerns about both online and offline racism um, towards Chinese people, uh, as well as people of Asian descent, be it Japanese, Korean. 
I'm asking, I'm wondering if, if you could tell me about, about are, are you witnessing this online? Are you experiencing it personally? Or, or is this something that, that, that is accurately when people talk about this? Is that, do you think that this is a problem that we need to really kind of work on as well? Um, I'm just trying to understand if, if this online racism is something that, that, that is, 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 is really something that, that people are struggling with day to day now in 2020. Yeah. I would say, yeah, I, I agree with that. Like I definitely, my I personally have more concerns just like going outside. Yeah. Uh, I remember in the early stage of the outbreak, like I bought some masks very early on in January because as I, as I mentioned, I expect this to reach yeah. you as sooner or later. But like, and my mom was like, uh, wanted me to wear it. But then also, both of us, also just concerned about like if we wear a mask if i wear a mask in the u.s as a chinese well i actually got discriminated more so that was a concern already like we already had in january and then we were right you know like it's just we heard incidents like this more and more often i have a really close friend in boston was like a chinese um and she was she was yelled at coronavirus like in in january or february yeah and i'm just hearing this incident every day so and you know in the last in my last few days in new york before i escaped uh when i was walking my dog outside i would really just like cover my whole face like i won't just like wear a mask i would like wear a mask wear a glass and wear a hat so people cannot tell who i am maybe i'm just overreacting but definitely i would say like at least in my like my internal affair ha has been growing but i also want to note you know it's not only people's attitude toward chinese here and it's also like you know chinese people's attitude toward foreigners and foreign people with like people with foreign connections in china i just felt like this this whole thing like you know the racism toward chinese and asian uh and also like you know chinese like their attitude toward foreigners is all like contributed by you know the two countries governments like stand off you know like like china like internally chinese propaganda machine is also like sending a lot of like messages that would provoking this kind of nationalism and xenophobia to like to chinese domestic audience just like what trump is doing here in the us so i would just say you know like as, as like so Chinese, like Chinese and Asian descendants, like are not the only people who are, like, suffering this kind of um, discrimination or this kind of, you know, weird attitude toward right now. Yeah, I think a lot of people are infected. Well, I I think that's important because I, I I follow some journalists that are um, Western journalists in in China and they've reported a rise of some xenophobia uh, xenophobia uh, phobia that they're seeing uh, anger towards foreigners and seeing the same thing happen in the US. It's, you see when, when people are, are, feel, are, are fearful, uh, they, the worst elements come out. And I think that's one thing that, that um, both journalists and then people like me that work in think tanks and, and human rights groups have to really convey a message to wider society that we're all in this together, um, that it's a virus, it's not caused by a person's ethnicity, it's time to, to, to try to, to, to fight kind of closed-mindedness. So, so we, I really want to thank you for joining us. Um, you gave us so much information about your work as a journalist, but also with your connection to China and being Chinese in America, that it's going to really help us think about human rights during this global pandemic. So, so thank you very much. Thank you for asking all these important questions and having me here. Thank you. Thank you.